on um, natural language processing for enhancing teaching at and learning at scale and free case studies. So Diane is a professor of computer science at uh, University of Pittsburgh and also a senior scientist at the Learning Research and Development Center also at the University of Pittsburgh. So without further ado, let's have Diane. Thanks, Min. So um, I've been working in the area of natural language processing and AI in general applied to educational applications since I moved to the University of Pittsburgh in 2001, partly because of my appointment, as Min said, with the Learning Research and Development Center. Oh, do I have to point this somewhere correctly? Yeah. Can you try pressing down? Yeah. Oh, down. Okay. okay. So there are a variety of roles that natural language processing could um, play in supporting educational applications. Probably the most obvious one is if you're studying some inherently linguistic domain, you would want natural language processing to deal with for example, analyzing the correctness of the linguistic phenomena. So examples of this might be uh, cases where you're teaching students to read, write, or speak. And the first case study that I'll be presenting will in fact be in this area of automatic essay grading. So given a student written input as, um, given a student's written essay as input, the, you want the computer to come up with some sort of numerical score. Perhaps uh, less obviously, you can also use natural language processing as the teaching method for domains that have nothing to do with language. So although I won't have time to talk about it during my talk, but feel free to ask me more about it during the breaks, I've done a lot of work in applying spoken dialogue technology, the kind of systems you see that support systems like Siri, to develop one-on-one -on -one tutoring systems where students converse with the computer to simulate that, that learning paradigm. And this can be in any domain, so our work in particular has been in the STEM domain of uh, physics. And the third area, which is, um, again, totally different, is that you don't you're not studying something linguistic, you're not using language as your primary method of teaching, but there are a lot of artifacts that are text-based or speech-based that would be useful for students or teachers or even researchers to be able to process. And so that's the third area where there's been a lot of work in using NLP for education. And the second, two, second and third case studies that I'll be presenting will be in this area. So the second one I'll be talking about is peer feedback. Uh, not which is also used in writing assessment, but instead of focusing on the actual papers, we're going to be focusing on the comments that students give when they review the papers. And then the third and final case study will be in the area of um, student reflection and will be focused on teachers rather than students and how we've used uh, natural language summarization as part of an app for summarizing student reflections in large, large classes. Um, and I wanted to just kind of give an overview at least how my research uh, sort of life cycle works, and this is not just me, it's, it's true of many people in this uh, area, which is highly interdisciplinary and often very applications oriented. So usually the research comes out of some real world need that um, teachers or students or researchers have in, in some educational context. Then motivated by that need, because uh, a lot of these problems have actually been studied by learning scientists, cognitive psychologists, and uh, educational psychologists, and so mm -hmm. forth, we can build on that literature as a way of kind of figuring out how to frame the problem. Um, so there's lots of theoretical work, and there's also lots of data, especially now in this era of big data and data science, that gives us um, things that we can statistically analyze to get empirical foundation for building the systems. And then finally, with the problem and sort of the um, theoretical background to, to guide the approach, typically then we develop algorithms, incorporate in some sort of technology, which we can then deploy in, in um, some real, real world authentic environment and evaluate it to see how it meets the problem, the goals that we attempted to solve or not. And then usually the cycle will, will continue. Usually it will get part of the way in solving the problem, but other things or limitations can be addressed and we keep going until we're happy. So from an NLP research uh, perspective, this sort of paradigm is very interesting and challenging. So first, uh, a lot of the data that we deal with is very noisy. So student-generated content is like user-generated content from social media and that it's often uh, ungrammatical and has kind of um, lots of other problems compared to, for example, newspaper texts where a lot of NLP research had previously been um, 
trained on, on data from that genre. Uh, also, because we're interested in supporting teachers, there are more constraints than just getting systems that are highly accurate. So often we not just want our systems to be reliable and replicating sort of the end results that the um, humans also get, but we'd like them to do it in the same way. So the constructs need to be meaningful to support either acceptance by educational um, uh, customers or else because we'd like to give feedback that um, would be useful for students. And so, if, and, and I'll talk more about this with uh, the writing work in the next part of the talk. And finally, another constraint besides our, our sort of approaches need to be pedagogically meaning, meaningful is that often these algorithms are incorporated into a interactive real-time systems and so that also highly constrains the type of approaches we can take because many high-performing approaches won't support real-time behavior. Okay, so with that, I'd like to um, now go through these three case studies to try to illustrate some of these points. The first area I'm going to talk about is automatic writing assessment, and all of the work that I, I'll be talking about is in collaboration with faculty PIs who I've shown here, and then large teams of associated postdocs and grad students and undergraduates. And the interesting thing about all these teams is they're highly interdisciplinary. So the first project, these two uh, people, are from uh, the School of Education at uh, Pitt, and the second two projects are done in collaboration with uh, faculty from the Cognitive Psychology Department. Okay, so why uh, automatic writing assessment? So automatic writing assessment has actually been one of the oldest areas of NLP applied to education, largely because of the need for um, companies such as in the US, ETS, or in uh, the UK, Cambridge English, I'm not sure what testing company is here, but they give these assessments and they're currently manually graded and people would like to use automation to try to replace that. And in fact, in many of these companies now, at least for some of the low stakes testing, they are using automatic grading in conjunction with, with human grading. So it's been around for a while, but it's gotten a lot of attention recently due to the emergence of massive online, open online courses. So these are these giant courses with tens of thousands of students. And currently, the type of grading that makes sense in those contexts is multiple choice or true-false, which isn't particularly interesting for lots of, of assessment needs. So to go beyond that to do um, assigned papers and be able to grade those automatically at scale, one needs to either go to fully automated assessment, such as I'll be talking about now, or to human-graded assessment with the students in the class, which is the next topic I'll be talking about. But even before this issue of scale came up, um, even in just a regular traditional classroom, it's still useful to have automatic writing assessment, particularly in the early formative stages, so teachers could assign more um, writing before the final paper that they actually get graded and give students feedback. So the particular writing assessment that I'll be talking about is something called uh, the response to text as assessment, which was developed by my two colleagues in the School of Education. And this was um, developed partly to address a current trend in the U.S. that uh, people are very interested now in teaching students how to write in response to sources. So instead of giving just an open-ended prompt where they basically base things on their own opinion, they're told to read something and then create an argument by drawing on the text to support, um, for example, an argument. So in this example, students are given a short article to read. This is. Uh, about the Millennium Village Project in Kenya from Time for Kids, so, so it's a kid's version of the Time magazine that you're probably all familiar with. Uh, the teachers, and this is given in the context of an elementary school classroom, so the teacher gives them this, they read it out loud, they focus on some of the vocabulary, and after that they're asked to write in response to this text a short argumentative essay. So here the essay is, um, in response to what did the author convince you that winning the fight against poverty is achievable in our lifetime? Explain why or not, why not with three to four examples from the text to support your answer. So they have to create an argument and support it by taking um, examples from this particular text. So in automatic grading assessment, there are two type of approaches for grading. Many things um, give a holistic rubric. So basically, you give one grade and it kind of captures everything. Another approach is to do what's called trait-based grading, where you have sort of orthogonal grading dimensions. So this RTA is of that variety, and there are actually five assessment directions, uh, dimensions. And the one I'm going to be focusing on here is one of the more substantial uh, ones related to argumentation. There are other dimensions that are more surface level, such as grammatical analysis, which 
Vital will be talking about that kind of analysis later. So this, um, this rubric basically says you can grade an essay from a scale of one to four, which one's the lowest, four's the highest. I've just highlighted that the whole essay is based on factors of evidence, so I put, highlighted the word evidence in the rubric. And then each row is a different um, point with respect to evidence that the graders have to pay attention to. For, so for example, the first row um, is based on how much evidence there is, so it's quantity. And the next three rows are based on the quality of evidence. So if you have, um, even if you have enough evidence, you want it to be good evidence. And just to give you a feel for the data, this is an essay from um, a student in grades four to six. So in the US, grade six is about 12, age 11 or 12. So they're really young kids, which is one difference between uh, this assessment and most work in, which has been done with older children. Um, so, and this essay gets a very low score. So in blue, you see the score that the human gave it. And um, in red, I've highlighted the output of our NLP algorithm and actually trying to identify, is there any evidence from that article that they read that was made it into the text? So you can see the score is low and just the fact that there's very little evidence that the system found, the system score will probably be low as well. Um, the second student got the best score, so the score four, and you can see that the system correspondingly also found a lot of evidence, so at least from the quality um, quantity, there's lots of evidence, and I'll talk more about the quality later. And you can see these essays are going to be challenging for a computer to process, first because they're fairly short, and second because there are a lot of problems with them um, from the lower levels. So for example, spelling is incorrect, so you can see the first piece of evidence, poverty is misspelled. Um, there are lots of other problems. These essays actually aren't so bad. They have punctuation. Some essays have no punctuation, no capitalization, no um, paragraph boundaries, and so forth. Okay, so our work in this area um, that we've currently done is uh, mostly been focused on this idea of summative assessment. We have these essays. We have the human grade that was assigned based on the rubric, and we'd like our computer to replicate those scores. And we focused on two of the five dimensions that are sort of the most substantial in that they're related to these higher level skills such as argumentation. And I'll be talking today just about the um, work we've done in evidence and if you're interested we've also done work on a second dimension about uh, organization of evidence. And as I highlighted in the beginning, uh, one thing that distinguishes our approach from a lot of other work is that we're trying to restrict our algorithm to have pedagogically meaningful features. So we are not only concerned with reliability, namely does our scoring algorithm score similarly with respect to the numbers it produces compared to the um, humans, but is it using the features that the rubric is, is uh, specifying is how one should grade. So th those are the validity concerns. Okay, so here now I've transferred the rubric just into a more operational form of a decision tree. And um, basically we've used this to guide the features. So the way we're using NLP is we take the essay, we process it to try to construct features representing each of these decision points, and then with that we'll feed that into a statistical method to try to learn a model for predicting the scores. So at the root of the tree you can see we're concerned with the quantity of evidence. We just want to see how much evidence there is. If uh, there's less than two pieces of evidence, you get a score of one. And if there's more than two pieces of evidence, then you start looking at uh, the quality of the evidence. So the first feature that we've developed is something that's going to count the number of pieces of evidence. And this is just, um, it's not as simple as it sounds. So people don't necessarily use exact phrases. So you can't just look for a direct word overlap. There's some uh, semantic <coughs> analysis involved as well. Um, if we need to go beyond quantity to quality, one and these ba three nodes basically correspond to the bottom three rows in the table version of the rubric. One thing that um, students are asked to do is not just to list the evidence, but actually elaborate on it. And that's what uh, the feature that represents that decision point addresses. Um, we call that our concentration feature. So we try to see once we have evidence, is it all clustered together, for example, in the same sentence, or is it spread throughout the essay, which suggests students are, are providing some elaboration uh, between each point that they're making. Um, another 
way that quality is measured is that students are asked to be very specific. So for a particular points such as medical care, the actual original article will give lots of examples. So they're not supposed to just say medical care improved, but they're supposed to actually list some of the concrete ways in which it approved, it, it improved. Um, and so we also have methods that we've developed to try to capture that feature. Uh, the last feature, which is the sophistication of evidence, has to do with relating the evidence to a thesis statement, which would have required us to develop an algorithm for identifying a thesis statement. We were working on that, but at the time this work was done, hadn't done that yet. So for this, we actually put a non-valid feature in there, just word count, um, as a temporary fallback feature. The reason many um, prior studies have worked so well, even though they haven't been at all concerned with sort of using features related to the rubric is that very simple features that are easy for NLP systems to compute, for example, just counting the number of words are in fact highly predictive. So longer essays typically um, perform with, get higher scores than shorter essays. Okay, so once we transformed each of our essays into this feature representation, we then use a standard supervised learning approach to try to learn a model for predicting uh, future essays that didn't have grades. Uh, so for our training and testing data, we used a corpus uh, that was collected by my colleagues on the project. It's about 1,500 um, essays written by students in grades four to six. So those were the examples you saw earlier. And um, we used those. Those had been pr prior, previously labeled by experts for manual grades. So given the features and the output we desired, we used uh, machine learning to train a model, and then we could then apply that to future data. To see if our, how our approach worked, we compared it to some very competitive uh, baselines from the literature. So essay scoring has received a lot of attention lately, and there, in fact, have been some um, competitions that have given big monetary prizes for the winners and have received a lot of uh, attention in the popular press. So one of the best performing algorithms used a very simple approach based basically just on looking at word, bag of words, lexical items. And uh, so that was an easy baseline for us to compute. We also used uh, one that went beyond sort of the lexical level to the uh, deeper semantic level, building on other um, algorithms from the literature that use the technique of latent semantic analysis. OK, so the, the first question we were interested in was, did our result work from this reliability al analysis? Could we, um, instead of using these features which had nothing to do to the rubric, could we do as well as those algorithms or even better by the new features that um, were, were motivated by the dimensions and the instructions in the rubric. So here you can see in blue is the first baseline, red is the second baseline, green is our algorithm learned with our new features. On the x-axis are the two evaluation metrics, so accuracy, just did we get the same number as the gold standard or not. Quadratic weighted cap is what the community usually uses instead because it penalizes different type of errors um, in such that if the gold standard is a four and you say predict three, that will be penalized less than if the gold standard is a four and you predict um, one. And so the basic takeaway point is that the green bars are higher and these are significant um, improvements compared to the baselines. Um, other results which, uh, if you're interested, I refer you to the associated papers, are that continuing in the evidence, um, we were interested in this word count feature, which we had put in kind of as a placeholder for just distinguishing score four from the others. And we did some ablation studies to see how important that was for the other features where we actually had uh, design features for the rubric. And in fact, we found that the only place that word count really was needed was in this area where we haven't covered with um, our own NLP approaches. Uh, we also had access after the project uh, was ongoing to a second corpus from slightly older kids. So the first was grades four to six. This was grades six to eight. And we found the same result, that using the same features, the same approach, we um, again outperformed uh, the baselines. And finally, we've now sort of replicated the whole um, evaluation paradigm on a second um, set where we were, instead of looking at the evidence rubric, we were looking at the organization rubric. So organization here is different than a lot of the work in NLP, which is purely from a writing perspective. Here we're more concerned with, um, with once we know that we actually have evidence, we want to see if it's presented in a coherent manner. 
So just as before, we developed new features using NLP to sort of capture this idea of coherence of um, evidence, and then we compared those to baselines, the same baselines on both corpora, and again, uh, showed that our work indeed added value to the uh, baselines. Okay, so the second area I'd like to talk about now is turning from automatic writing assessment to a different way of approaching writing assessment that uses uh, humans instead of computers to achieve the needs of scale. So as I mentioned, MOOCs typically, if they're going to allow writing assessment, have chosen to do one of two options. Some of the platforms that are out there have incorporated this automated approach that I just talked about. Others don't really think that's ready yet, and so instead they've argued for using a peer review approach, and they have uh, support for facilitating that. And again, while it's receiving a lot more attention these days because of um, its usage in MOOCs, peer review has actually been around for a very long time and is used in smaller classes, not necessarily because uh, scale is the motivation, but it's actually a really good learning environment. So from the students' perspective, who are the students who are receiving the feedback, um, sometimes it's better for them to get feedback from students rather than from teachers because first they get a lot more feedback because you have typically four to six people reviewing your paper rather than one person. And second, because you also have so many different people reviewing it, they're all going to find different things and so you get sort of a diversity of opinions. Um, equally, if not more important, is students not only learn by reading what people think of their own papers, but when they're asked to review other papers, they learn a lot as well and can often bring the insights that they get from being a reviewer back to um, help improve their own writing. So for this research, we um, started by uh, looking at a peer review system that my colleague, Christian, who, as I mentioned, is a kind of psychology professor, had developed. Um, called SWORD, which stands for Scaffolded Writing and Rewriting in the Disciplines. And he himself had developed this actually to handle issues of scale in his own courses, because at our university, the introductory psychology courses have about 400 students, one instructor, and very few TAs. And so he didn't feel like he could assign writing unless he resorted to peer review. So he basically built a system that sort of handled the bookkeeping, much like um, START or Easy Chair for those of us who do academic reviewing. So the idea is students, as authors, will submit something to be reviewed. Typically, it's papers, but it could actually be um, anything else. The system then will assign the papers to the other students in the class, and the system can either do it itself or the teacher can do the assignments manually. This is, in this system, everything's done um, totally anonymously. Once the students then get their set of papers to review, and typically they get about four to six, they're asked to evaluate the papers with respect to a rubric which the teacher is, uh, has to input into the system. And the rubric has two parts, numerical ratings, just like we saw in the previous um, part of, of this presentation, but also text comments. And that, that's the area that I'm going to be focusing on right now. And the particular problem I'm going to address is that students don't really often know how to write these textual comments in ways that are useful. Not just students, stuff. many of us often complain about the quality of the reviews we get from our own professional peers. So it's not something that's taught. And um, if the comments are good, it kind of defeats the purpose of the educational benefits of peer review. So there are many ways of measuring review quality. The one that I'm just going to be focusing on for this presentation is something called localization. And this is, does the comment pinpoint where in the paper the feedback that you're um, providing applies? And the reason we looked at this is that prior work on um, corpora from earlier deployments of SWORD where they'd been manually coded for respect to feedback quality with from the perspective of, did the student, once they got the feedback, actually change their paper to address this feedback, found that students didn't necessarily implement the feedback. And one of the things that was highly predictive of whether they, they revised their paper to address it was whether the comment included localization. So to give you some examples of what this um, means, the first comment is um, an example of something that's localized. And the green bits are the part of the text which actually convey the localization. So here, there was a part in the results section. So the student reviewer is telling the student author where in their paper they should actually look. So there are lots of sections. They tell them to focus on the results section. That's where this comment is um, talk with comments talking about. And then furthermore, within the results section, they actually quote the actual sentence that's problematic. So it's very clear for the student how to revise the paper, which sentence they should change. 
as opposed to the second comment, the biggest problem was grammar and punctuation. All the writer has to do is change certain tenses and add commas and colons here and there. So here and there is not particularly useful. If the student doesn't know how to do these things and needs to find out where they did it wrong by here and there, they're probably not going to be able to find it and they're not going to be able to fix this problem. So the approach we took was to first use NLP as a way of automatically giving a, a new text comment into the system, determining whether it had this, these good properties, localization. And we've also worked on another property, which was shown to be highly predictive of implementation, namely solution. So if you mention a problem, give an idea, one suggestion for how you might fix the problem. And then once we've done this, if the, um, after these uh, detection analysis ran, if there wasn't enough of, of, if there weren't enough comments with these good properties, we would give some tutoring to the students on how to write better comments and ask them to revise it before they actually got sent to the author. And that's what um, I'm going to call scaffolding reviewers. So for this detection phase, we again used um, a supervised learning approach where natural language processing was used to extract features that we believe would be uh, useful for predicting localization and solution. And then machine learning algorithm was used to actually find the, develop the model where we had already a, a, um, a corpus of, of comments that were labeled for localization and solution. And um, these are just some of the features, and by far not all of them, of the type of things we were looking at. So there were expressions of things like sections and on page so forth. Um, Domain lexicons, which is useful for paraphrasing. So you wanted to see if people were actually talking about content from the um, paper. Um, there are certain syntactic constructions people use. And as you saw, <coughs> quotation detection. So once we had that uh, algorithm, we then went back to the original sort system and added this detection scaffolding component. So this part in the middle is part of the original sort interface. So when the student gets to the reviewing phase of the process, the <coughs> different prompts that, the, that from the teacher's rubric are shown here. They'll look for clear evidence, and each person fits into each level. This was a rubric to anal in an English class to analyze students writing about Dante's circles of levels of hell. And then here, comment when the writing conveys ideas controlled in an interesting manner, and so forth. So, um, this rubric had these two prompts. Students had to give at least one text comment, but they were allowed to give a second one. And so after the students submitted this review, the um, localization model that was trained on prior uh, corpora, not the ones that it was evaluated on, were applied to every uh, comment, so every box that had a comment. So in here, this would be applied to both of these comments. Then we would uh, see how many comments overall had these good properties. And if it was below a uh, threshold, which we empirically uh, optimized on our uh, training and development data, instead of sending these comments off to the reviewer, which was the original version of the system, you just wrote them and they got sent on, we would uh, give the students a little tutoring and suggest that they revise them. So at this point, instead of being submitted this red pop-up um, this, the screen would refresh with this red message from the system. Uh, so this one, and this varies. We had authored a few of them, so they didn't get the same message all the time. So the idea of these messages, we first remind them what, what this property is. So make sure that every for every comment below, you explain where in the paper it applies. So we're defining localization. And then we gave them some examples. So here we gave them an example with using a template form that you could say something on page or on, on paragraph something. And we had various other um, messages using different techniques. OK, so finally, once the student read this message and reevaluated their comments, they could then make one of three choices, which is shown by these buttons. So one button was they could ask for more help that this message isn't long enough so they could sort of get all the prompts on one page. Students very rarely actually ask for help. Um, the, the second option is that they could disagree with the system, either because they were lazy and just didn't want to deal with it and told the system to go away, or the system, obviously, is just an algorithm and it makes mistakes. Um, so if they hit this button, that's what I'm going to be calling disagree. Or they could actually take the system's advice, attempt to revise it, and then resubmit it. And um, originally, we kept 
doing this, and that got very annoying fast. So in the current version of the system, they basically get this advice once and then go on. OK, so does this work? Um, to test both the performance of our algorithm and as well as its use then in changing ch uh, students' behavior, we've <coughs> evaluated in several uh, classroom situations. And this was the first evaluation, and that's the one I'll, I'm going to be talking about. OK, so again, what we did was we developed uh, this NLP detection algorithm with the goal of extracting attributes from reviews in real time. And this real time aspect was actually quite important. So there were certain things we couldn't do in real time, such as parsing, which was just too slow that, um, to get like almost an immediate response from the system. Um, then we used these attributes in a prediction model, which was trained on prior data, to label every comment, whether with respect to it was localized. And then based on this threshold that was empirically determined from our training and development data, we triggered the scaffolding intervention when 50% of the comments, less than 50% of the comments were predicted as localized. Uh, this evaluation was based on a deployment in an undergraduate research methods class. This is a psychology class at the University of Pittsburgh. It was not taught by any of the PIs involved in designing the system, so it was a separate faculty member. And this was a nice class for us because it gave two different opportunities for peer review. So here, students first had to outline their paper in a graphical diagram format. That diagram was then sent for peer review. So that's the first set of reviews we're going to analyze. Then once that process was done, they wrote their first draft of their paper. And that was also sent for um, peer review. And so that's the second draft. And we had developed different localization models for diagrams versus uh, papers, but both using NLP techniques. And this just gives you a size of our data set. This was a big uh, introductory psychology class, so there are lots of sections. So overall, we had um, almost 200 students, data from almost 200 students. Since each student reviewed four to six reviews, you can see we had over 700 reviews. And of those reviews, the ones that did pass the threshold, that's the number where they actually students got this pop-up message and were asked to do something. OK, so the first result is just like in the prior um, study, we were interested in can we actually um, automate what, in, with respect to our, were our predictions of predicting localization the same as what the humans coded for localization? So for each comment, there's a gold standard label, and do we get that or not? And so you can see we have uh, the paper review, the diagram review. Those are our two data sets. We have um, different evaluation. Uh, Met metrics, so just as before, we have accuracy and kappa, which controls, in this case, not quadratic weighted because it's just a binary decision, but this controls for uh, chance agreements. Um, so it's more uh, informative than just accuracy. As our baseline here, we just use a majority class algorithm. And you can see the majority class was actually different in the two corpora. But even in uh, the paper review, which had more localization, there was still basically half of the comments were not localized. And then the red shows the performance of our models. And so first you can see that the detection models significantly outperform these uh, baselines. And we were particularly um, happy about this because the models were trained and tested on data from within sort of the same corpora. And none of them were from the research methods. So basically, we were able to develop features that were an abstract level that they were able to transfer to new unseen uh, courses. Uh, the second way that we could analyze system performance was not at this comment level, but at a higher level, which represents what the system, what the students actually perceived with respect to the system. So the students didn't know that 50% was this triggering accuracy. All they saw was that they submitted a bunch of comments, and they either got or got didn't get a message. So from the student's perspective, the system was working correctly if when they got the message, there was actually at least one comment for them to fix. And if all the comments already had the desired property, so for example, all of the comments had localization, but the system still told them to fix it, that's the case where the system performance would be considered incorrect. And so from this perspective, our system worked extremely um, well. So there was only one case where the system told the students, there was something to fix when there actually wasn't anything to fix. OK, so that's from analyzing how well the system actually did in this prediction task. Now we're interested in, in turning to, given this technology, what did the students do with it? 
Um, so the first thing we wanted to look at was how they responded to the scaffolding of those two but those three buttons, see example, agree, disagree. Did they actually agree with the system and take take the system's advice and change things, or did they just ignore the system and say, submit it, I'm not going to fix it? And so this we had mixed results. So you can see that uh, the revised column shows that a large number of students actually did attempt to revise their, their uh, reviews in response to the system, which was good. But unfortunately, an even larger number in both cases disagreed. And this was really surprising to us because, as we just saw in the previous slide, there was only one case where the system was actually wrong. Otherwise, there was always something to fix. So we, uh, one thing we tried to look at was why are they disagreeing? Um, we've looked at all sorts of things. We looked at how close it was to the deadline. Maybe people, because there was a late penalty, so maybe people who were doing their reviews at the last minute didn't actually have time to do it. We didn't find any correlation with that. We also looked at um, what percentage of the, the comments um, needed to be fixed. So we had this ratio of 50%, but maybe it turned out that for all these interventions, the students, let's say, had submitted nine comment, 10 comments, and nine of them were already localized. There was only one to fix. And in that case, maybe it would make more sense that they disagreed. But we found there was no uh, relationship there either. If students had 90% um, 90% of the comments needed to be fixed or 10% of the comments needed to be fixed. The disagreement rates were still pretty much the same. So if anyone has any suggestions about uh, why you think reviewers might be disagreeing, we'd be very interested in hearing that. Um, so now turning to the students who actually made an attempt, who who'd actually agreed with the system and tried to review their, re improve their comments, did they learn how to do uh, localization? So what we see here are these are the four different cases we can have. So this is what the original, and this is based on human annotation, not on the actual system predictions. So here are the four different cases we have. This is the original uh, review before the intervention, and then after revision, this is what the um, comment looked like after that. And the two areas that we were basically targeting were for the comments that were of low quality, not localized, did the students fix them and change them to localized? So we can see from the, um, from the first row in green, that was the case that we wanted, that it started out of low quality, they got the scaffolding, they revised it, and they fixed it. Um, the other case uh, was basically they started out not localized, they either, um, and they tried to fix it, and at least um, they were unsuccessful um, according to the human annotator. So that's not necessarily bad, but it's not good either. What we did not want to happen was that it started out to be a good comment and turned into a bad comment. Luckily, that didn't happen. And we have some, some insights about this that we think might change those numbers slightly. So for example, some of the rubric prompts, localization doesn't really make sense. So some of them are actually like yes, no. So that kind of case, it would start off as not localized. They're not going to be able to fix it because it doesn't make sense for the prompt, so it's not going to change. So we're also now trying to, um, to fine tune our algorithm so it doesn't, it first filters for respect to, with respect to rubric prompts where localization actually makes sense. Um, other results is that we found a transfer effect even later on in the review process. So when they had later papers or, um, you know, in the next assignment, we found that once they were taught this, they actually kept up the skill. And finally, we've basically done the same analyses with other data sets that we've gotten from other classrooms since this study, a different psychology uh, class, and we've also looked now at assignments from two different high school levels in the area of math rather than English. Okay, so for the uh, last thing I'd like to um, talk about is, in now moving totally away from writing a segment to a very different field of uh, supporting and moving from student-oriented systems to teacher-oriented systems is the area of student reflection. Okay, so why are we interested in student re reflections, and in particular, why do we want to summarize them? So the idea of having students reflect, at, for example, at the end of a large lecture, is that it's been shown in, again, in the cognitive science, learning science literature, that this is a very good activity. So first it helps students learn better by ha making them sort of think about what 
what they know and what they don't know, they're better able to sort of address their knowledge gaps. So students who write high quality reflections show better outcomes um, in various studies. And from a teacher perspective, it's also good for them to have sort of a window into where their lecture is working, where it's not, and how they might change what they would have done by default in the next class. So from, um, so that's why we're doing, we're interested in reflection. Why we're interested in summarizing reflections is that in large classes, if um, an instructor's given a lot of this reflection data, it's just too much for them to read. So even before MOOCs, uh, in the US at least, introductory science classes are typically a couple of hundred students. If you have, you know, 400 reflections for one prompt and you give a couple of prompts and you have to do that, you know, twice a week, most instructors aren't going to do that. And once you move to MOOC scale, it would be impossible. So here's an example of the data that we um, are looking at. So at the top, you can see the, an example prompt. So after, and this is from a materials science engineering class. So um, after the class, and this data all comes from a paper and pencil um, usage of reflection, the students were told to answer the prompt, describe what was confusing or needed more detail. And they were also given two other prompts that I'll show later. And then the students had to write this down on a piece of paper. So I've shown eight um, examples. There are actually 53 students in the class. So the teacher in this class would basically get 53 uh, reflections for each prompt, and they had three prompts. So they didn't want to read 53 times um, three reflections. And so instead, in this class, the poor TA was asked to summarize this data, and that was what the TA actually looked at before the um, next class. And so this is an example of what the TA produces. And I've tried to color code it just so you can see how the summary reflects, relates to the original data. So what the TA does is they basically um, describe, typically in a short phrase, um, sort of the underlying concepts or semantics that, uh, that relate to a bunch of prompts. And then here, they put the number of students who um, this basically covers. So here, this graphs of attraction, repulsive, and atomic separa separation. That's um, from 10 students. The first two are shown up here. And you can see the, it's not exactly verbatim. They pick and choose words from both of them and create uh, something new. And then the uh, second most um, confusing concept was properties and equations with bond strength. And you can see that comes also from two of those, and there are more that go on. And then they did summarize everything, but just picked um, typically for three to four points for what the TA ended up including. So our research was motivated. Could we um, basically replace the human TA, because that was a lot of work for them, with NLP techniques? And the goal, again, was motivated by this issue of scale. We wanted to try to enhance how the instructor-student uh, interaction would occur in large classes by enabling the the teachers to get uh, an idea of, of what the, um, how the students in the class were responding, but not having to read all of them. So to do this, our work has sort of two aspects. First, we developed, and this app development was primarily by my uh, faculty colleague, who's one of our HCI faculty, a mobile app to uh, collect and browse the student reflections, so go from the paper and pencil scenario to a purely online uh, collection mechanism. And our work, my work in particular, my students' work, has been um, focused on within this app using a, a new algorithm that we've developed for summarization to support that functionality of the app. Okay, so from an NLP perspective, this is uh, challenging compared to um, other approaches to summarization. So in the field of summarization, there are kind of two paradigms. One is something called extractive, where the summary is just to compressed version of the original inputs, but you don't rewrite new text like we saw the human TA doing. You basically take um, the original text and just uh, take parts of them to make the um, summary shorter. And um, that's called extractive summarization. And that's the approach we'll be taking here. Um, but unlike most prior work, which has been done in not in user-generated content, but in the area of, for example, newspaper text, where summaries are usually created by lifting out sentences, our inputs are very diverse in that we don't have these nice, well-formed sentences that every student has. Some of the students' um, responses are single words. Others actually write paragraph lengths. So um, the input to granularity is quite different. 
A second issue we had is because the reflections are so short, there was very little overlap in the vocabulary. And most um, summarization approaches take advantage of there, there's a lot of repetition in um, larger text. So we had to move to an approach that was more semantically um, based. And the third constraint on our work is that we were very interested in this deployment on a mobile app. So even if we did have these well-formed sentences, it's not clear that would be the best thing to do on an app because of the small screen space. Um, so in response to these challenges, we developed uh, a new approach to summarization um, that's at the phrase level. So it basically follows these three stages. The first phase was to extract phrases um, as the candidates to include in the summary. So this was a way of trying to normalize our inputs to the same level of granularity. And for our work, all of our prompts were sort of WH questions. So we used noun phrases as um, our extraction method. Um, we actually tried expanding that, and it didn't really um, help. So the second stage was once we had all the potential noun phrases that could be in the summary to try to figure out which ones to include. To um, capture this notion of students' coverage, which was basically what I tried to show when I showed the data with the different colors, we wanted to try to cluster the phrases so that the clusters would each correspond to one of those color-coded lines in the summary. And we um, used an algorithm that did clustering based on uh, semantics rather than uh, purely lexical approaches. And then the final stage was once we had these cl clusters to create the summary by first ranking the clusters by how many students they represented. So since for every phrase that made it into cluster, we know which student originally um, had that phrase, we could see how many students' um, phrases were in that cluster. So we then sorted them by that, which is how the TA had done it. And then within a cluster, we had to pick the most representative phrase. So we Developed or examined different um, scoring algorithms for picking one phrase from a cluster to represent the whole cluster. Uh, the data, as we were developing our algorithm, was from that data set I showed earlier, which is a material science and engineering class, 53 students, three reflection prompts. So here you can now see the other two besides the one that I um, showed earlier. And our semesters are much longer than in US, so, and most classes are twice a week. So we actually had 25. Uh, lectures, and um, this was a lot of work for the TA, so they only did 12 of them. So we have 12 lectures with three summaries per lecture because there are three prompts. So those are our gold standards. Um, as with many summarization algorithms, we're going to follow sort of the standard quantitative evaluation metric that that community uses. Um, as in the prior studies, we're going to compare our approach to competitive baselines, which are approaches in, um, the, that are already out there in the literature. And then we're going to examine how our approach does in, um, in, in creating summaries that are similar to the human created summaries uh, quantitatively. And in the field of summarization, there's a metric called Rouge, which is a recall oriented score. And um, there are lots of variations. So we looked at three of the most common ones. And basically, um, yeah, higher is, is um, better. So we have Rouge, Rouge scores that will compute that compare our summary for, to the TA summary. And the results were um, good for us, in, at least in that, in fact, our method did outperform all of our, our baselines, at least with respect to F measure for all three of these uh, Rouge scores for all of the, the data that we had. Um, once we had, had those results, we then uh, incorporated that algorithm into a mobile app. So this is the screenshot for actually reading the reflections if you're a student. So you can see the green. Maybe you can't read it, but this was described what was confusing or needs more detail. So each prompt is shown in green. And here's the summary, which is just like what we saw the TA. So here's the phrases. Um, each row represents a particular cluster, the phrase that we thought was best. And then on the app, we actually have this new functionality that if the student's phrase actually showed up in the summary, got highlighted in yellow. So teachers wouldn't see that, but students would see it. So every student would get the same. Um, summary, but except for the highlighting would vary for each student. In our first deployment, which was about a year ago, and I used it in my class, and uh, my HCI colleague used it in his class, so these were two computer science graduate uh, classes, uh, we, we deployed the system and we then had them evaluate at the end of the semester just using uh, surveys. And this, uh, these results were promising. So these are the only two survey questions related to the summary. But you can see the scores are positive on a 1 to 5 scale that students actually read the summaries and found them beneficial. 
Um, they also could give qualitative feedback, and we could see that the students, even though we originally designed this app for the teachers, the students actually liked it as well. They liked to see what other people said, so they liked to, to read other people's confusing points, and they liked having this highlighting to see how, how typical their uh, confusions were with respect to the rest of the class. And we now have deployed this in um, last spring. We now have some other deployments that we're still um, analyzing the data from those experiments. OK, to, so to sum up, what I've tried to show today is that um, NLP is a very nice technique um, that can be applied in a variety of ways to support both the needs of teachers and the needs of students that um, can scale. I start off by talking about writing assessment, two approaches, first fully automated and then technology enhanced human um, writing assessment, and those were both aimed at students. And then the last part of the talk, I turned to something different, focused more on teachers. And just as I introduced at the beginning of the talk, I think this is a um, very interesting application area for NLP, providing both lots of research opportunities and um, challenges. And some of them, again, are replicated here. Challenges of student content, which is much more like social media type of content the need to go beyond um, accuracy and this um, issues of actually then deploying these algorithms with all of the noise in their output in uh, these larger embedded um, educational technologies. All of these projects are still ongoing uh, for the response to text assessment. We're now moving beyond the, the summative feedback to formative feedback, and we'd like to actually tutor the systems as well, so if the students as well. So if they get a grade of one, for example, we'd like to give them feedback on why they got the grade of one. And this is where it's why it's very important to have our models be explainable in terms of the rubric. So it's not going to help students if we just tell them to make their essay longer, because that's not really what we care about. Um, we're also starting now in all of our projects to move, um, take these outputs and create teacher dashboards, which would be useful for the teachers as well. Uh, for SORT, we've now moved from just location analysis to solution, and we've done a big study which we're just now analyzing the data of a large-scale um, study of AP uh, English classes throughout the U.S. Uh, we also now, our original goal of, of doing the scaffolding was not just to help reviewers become better, re students become better reviewers, but also to help them become better writers. So the idea was if they got better feedback and also learned about uh, writing by reading other people's papers, that their final papers would be um, better as well. And we're now starting to do that analysis to see if making students better reviewers makes some students better writers. And finally, for course mirror, just as with um, the localization can be of mixed quality, the reflections also can be of mixed quality. We've developed some predictive models to code reflection quality, and we'd like to add that functionality to the interface. So um, if they're submitting bad reflections, to let them revise it before it gets sent to the teacher and to do um, more sophisticated evaluations. For example, once the teachers get it, do they, what do they actually do with the summary? Can we somehow see some changing in their teaching, um, teaching uh, behavior? I'd just like to put a plug for our technology. If you're interested, some of the technology as well as the data is available. So this peer review system has been used both at the high school and college level, both in the US and internationally by many, many people. There are two versions. The um, NLP enhanced system is free, but then you have to be, let us use you as a guinea pig to try turning things on and off in your classes. There's a commercial system that um, is also available. It doesn't have any of the NLP additions that I talked about, and it also has um, a small fee. The summarization system in this mobile app for reflections is now available on both Android and Apple platforms, and you can freely download that. And we'd be very excited if people used that and gave us feedback on that. And this uh, material science data set that we use for our own summarization algorithm, if you're an NLP person and want a data set to try uh, algorithm summarization on user-generated content, you're welcome to use the data that we use for our experiments. And uh, I think that's it. So thank you. Any questions? So, uh, in, in the writing assessment uh, system, if the scoring will be changes, 
Um, we, yes, we, we would have to yeah. have to develop new features that make sense for that, and then we'd have to retrain the model. So yes, that's, I guess, a potential disadvantage of a more rubric-independent approach that... Um, uh, right. So, okay. Uh, is that, uh, okay, I, I mean, I've never used uh, this kind of, well, I used auto grade as a uh, programming, so it's 100% correct, right? So the question now is, the kind of grading that is uh, this objective, uh, what, what is the minimum level of accuracy you sort of, you sort of need for us to have a system that we consider usable by engineers that we consider trustworthy? If, if the system is mostly right, but wrong enough times, then Right, so there's no absolute number, and it depends on, I think, the, the task that you're going to do it. So automatic grading in, like, the companies, most people don't use it for these high-stakes assessments because there are these errors. Um, so they use it typically in, in cases where you can give students feedback. And even if you give students wrong feedback, it's not necessarily always bad, it's sometimes a good learning experience for them to, to reconsider their, um, their efforts. And the way most professional companies use it is they usually have a human grader and the system, and then if it's off, then it will get, if it's, it's similar, then they'll accept it, and if it's off, they'll get a third one. But um, especially for these more subjective, so some dimensions are easier to grade, but these more subjective ones about evidence and writing coherence. Um, so, so one thing to note is even though the system wasn't, you know, as accurate maybe as one would like, even the humans find it difficult. So the top line isn't 100% kappa either. So typically people try to get um, some threshold, and again, what people pick as their threshold can be different with respect to the best that humans can do. So if humans can only do 80%, they're not going to, the system... Nobody would ever expect it to do 100%. But so it really depends. And that was, I guess, one of the points I was trying to make at the end, sort of because these algorithms are inherently imperfect, trying to figure out clever ways to use the system so that even if it gives you a wrong answer, it's not going to be harmful and you can still, um, it, it won't be harmful and maybe could be beneficial. It's, that's where there's a lot of interaction with uh, HCI and other kind of interface issues. Um, you mentioned that you've deployed it quite widely, and some of your products have actually been used by many institutions. So is that the result of um, a lot of marketing on the part of the university, or did uh, you know early adopters just come to you and say, I, I, I really want this technology, can I deploy it you know, next time I might should? Right, so with this peer review system, that had basically no advertising. So as I said, my colleague developed it for his own classes, and then other people heard about it. And then for his own research, research, he kind of exploited some context that he knew to try to get it. But then people started hearing about it and just requested it. And now, of course, that there's this actual company, I mean, there I don't really know much about how many people have bought it. I'm just because I'm not part of the company. So I'm just more familiar with the original research version. But it actually, I guess, met a need. So it just took off. So let's thank our keynote speaker, Diane. Okay, we're going to move uh, to our next presentation.